I'm going to go over some of the um, key things in the readings that you had for this week. Everything that you see in, t in text, and I'll show you in text, it's lifted straight from the two articles that you had to read, so you can find it there quite easily, and I cover everything in sequence. I'm going to begin by just uh, looking at an issue that was, was raised or a clarification that was given very early in the first of those two articles. That's to do with basically what we do with historical research. Whenever you look back at something, in, you look back either out of curiosity or you look back for a reason. When you look back for a reason, it's either going to be to find an explanation for it or to, to use that thing, whatever it was, in some way now. You're going to use it. You're going to learn from it and use it now. So in order to actually work out what, what something was, or what happened, or what, what something that you can see represents from the past, you've got to identify the context surrounding it. Once you've done that, you, you can begin to understand it better. You can see whether it's logical and consistent with what you know, the context, um, the things that you've decided about it. Are they, are they valid conclusions? I'm going to come to that again in a few minutes. And then having got that in the context of the past, you then look at it in the context of the present. What do we want today that's relevant to that object or item or event? And can we actually learn from it? What can we take from it? And that first paper, Patrick Lent, is all about taking something from it. That if you look at it and you know the context of the period, you will understand it. And then understanding it, you can then see if what you've identified is relevant now. The second point is that in order to, to look at uh, an artifact from the past or an event from the past, you do need this context, but you can get context not just from what was going on in the world, you know, were there battles going on, were there invasions going on, were there economic disasters going on, was it a period of prosperity or not, whatever. You can also get it from the individuals. And sometimes it's the individuals that give you the insight, because their background allows you to understand what happened. And in the case of the first article, that is exactly the case. So, one thing to look at when you're looking at any, anything in history is look at the major people involved. Look at the people involved. The Peasants' Revolt that was mentioned in the, uh, in the Arnold book. That, when I first heard about it a long time ago, we were told about the person who history believes was the leader. And that was the main focus of what we heard. So taking that person, a historian would go back and investigate what was known about that person. Maybe nothing. But if, if the historian finds out something, it begins to clarify why he led that revolt. Or why he was where he was, and which with hindsight we say indicates that he was the leader. So individual people are very important to history and to historical work. In the same way, if you go back just a few years to when David Cameron was Prime Minister of the UK. And you're looking at some of the decisions his government made. If you want to understand those decisions, you need to look at how he thought, what sort of things he did, what he believed in, what he didn't believe in. And that helps you to understand the decisions that were taken by looking through the eyes of the individual, which is why that article talks about Pacioli's lens. It's giving you a focus. Now, if you just take what it says, I'm going to summarize a few things here. 
before that article was published, the literature said that he was a compiler, a copyist. It, it, it wasn't something that he had written himself. As far as I'm aware, uh, the, I know that I believed he'd written it himself, and that Basil Yami believed that he'd written it himself. I'm not conscious of anyone else ever having said that in public. But the literature as a whole said that he'd copied it, and that he lacked the necessary expertise and experience to write such a document. And that his only contribution was he printed the manuscript on the subject. But in doing so, he undermined his contribution by making it incapable of teaching anyone anything. Now that's basically what the literature tells us, if you read it, until that paper. It, it was known um, 100 years ago that Pacioli worked for a merchant before he became a friar, and that he worked for the merchant for six years. But the perceived wisdom was, by reading of how he described himself, was that he was appointed as a guardian to the merchant's three children, not as an apprentice. The three children were almost the same age as Pacioli, and given his background and his abilities, the very idea that he was just a guardian to the children just does not make sense. But for a hundred years that was accepted. So, therefore, he'd never worked for much, and according to, to those people, in the sense of being his apprentice. Then the, there's a question about the, uh, in, the instructions in the manual. The person who, who made that, who drew up those accusations, is an economist. Economists don't tend to teach double entry bookkeeping, but let's imagine that that person did. There's a very good reason why that person might think that Pacioli's manual was unfit for purpose. But the thing that he focused on, that was Basil Yami, was the, in his, his mind, Pacioli did not indicate which account to debit, which account to credit, which meant that it wouldn't help anyone to do that. And that is identified and recognised as being the major, major problem that anyone who's learning double entry has. Which account to debit, which account to credit. And I'll return to that as, as well later on. In the Patchouli Lens paper, he's revealed as being highly motivated. He was a humanist, he was an educator. He was vocationally inspired to spread knowledge and understanding, and he developed a new way of teaching algebra, which actually revolutionized the teaching of, of algebra um, in the 16th century. It's been claimed that he wrote the first textbook. And he applied the same principles to the way that he, he taught the double entry. And what those principles, the approaches he adopted in algebra and double entry did, was they told the students, the learners, what they needed to know in order to use the techniques. Whereas previously, the teachers had just simply given the, the students, the learners, examples that they were required to solve. And the students had to work out for themselves how to apply the techniques. So Pacioli stopped that. And finally at this point, accounting processes are based on a simple and inherent logic. It's remarkably simple, double entry. Debit equals credit. It's the simplest algebraic equation that can exist. And because everything that goes into double entry record is recorded twice on opposite sides, 
and nothing else gets into it unless it goes in twice on opposite sides, one debit, one credit. It's an unbreakable logic. You can prove anything in double entry. Well, that's its basic powerful strength. As to what happened when people started using it in medieval Europe, Benedetto Cotrulli um, says it enables you to organize your records to ensure you always remember everything that is done and to know exactly what position you're in in terms of um, your debtors and your creditors. Your creditors are those that should have and those that should give you debtors. And you know what your costs are. And from your costs of your goods and the revenues for those goods, you know the profits and losses on those goods. And any other matter the merchant needs to know. Like who witnessed that? Why did that take place? They're all in the accounting records, the double entry accounting records. That's the benefit of it. It's organized database. And there were also the benefits of double entry over single entry, other methods, that Basil Yami acknowledged. So here you have a 20th century accounting historian agreeing that the reasons for using double entry as opposed to other methods of bookkeeping, agreeing that those reasons were the same. In 600 years they hadn't changed. So the same motivations behind it. And remember, it's a very simple piece of logic to make it work. But it was still mysterious to the people of that time. And it wasn't because they couldn't read. It was because it just seemed magical. You learn double entry, not in a school. Almost no one learned it from a tutor until the 16th century. He learned it in the workplace. Now, when you're learning something in the workplace, you need someone there in the workplace who can teach you. If you start training as a bookkeeper and you're sitting beside the current bookkeeper who is showing you how to do things, if that person does not actually know how to do bookkeeping, you're going to be taught um, nonsense. And certainly in the 16th century, we know that in Venice, it was believed that there were several people working as bookkeepers who hadn't a clue what they were doing. So in order to learn double entry, you need to be taught by someone who knew how to do it. And the bookkeepers learned on the job. And having learned how to do bookkeeping, they weren't about to move jobs. They might set up their own business, that's a different thing. But they would come into the business as an apprentice and learn the, the double entry as part of that. And then the ones that did it best would continue to do it. Or merchants would learn it from their fathers. And they would pass it on to their sons or to someone else that they brought in to train. But because all these people were in place who were bookkeepers in the 15th century, 16th century, who didn't actually know how to do double entry properly, there was no possibility of growing the workforce, of growing the number of people who were expert. There was no tuition of it in schools. There were only one tutor we know of in the 15th century. So the alternative was the printed book. And that's why Pacioli printed his book. Now he says at the beginning why he did it. And this is from the translation of von Gebb Sattel, 1994. That's the most recent English translation, but it's not very different from the other four English translations. The first of which was done in 1914 by John B. Giesbrick. You'll learn a lot more about the translations next week. And that's what we believed. It was written 
for the Duke of Urbino's people so that they could understand commerce better. That was Summa Arithmetica, the book in which the treatise on bookkeeping is held. And that the bookkeeping treatise was included so that they could have the knowledge they required to keep accounts and records. And we believed that now since 1914. In English, we believed it. And if you look at other translations in other languages, they, they believe it there too. But this is not what Pacioli said. So that's never been understood. And I'm going to leave that point, and we'll come back to it next week. Now, I previously uh, told you about speculative history, and you read about the invention of double entry and the diffusion of it. And they both rely to some extent on speculative history, which is where you take what you have in terms of evidence and knowledge of the surrounding context and understanding of it, and you put it together to arrive at a logical conclusion based on what you have. And if you do it successfully, you will have produced an explanation or an understanding based on those things that is supported by all those things, doesn't contradict any of them. And that's better than not having any explanation or understanding at all. But sometimes it means that you have to extrapolate great distances in thinking. So while you can get an answer and explanation, you can never be 100% sure, well you can never be 100% sure in history at all, but you cannot be um, certain that you've got, uh, you can't even be certain, you can never actually say, well it must have been that, it must have been that, you can't, just say all the evidence indicates. It's like if someone is, is uh, accused of robbing a bank, you take all the evidence available, put it together and present the case. The defendant will try and, and point out that some of the evidence isn't right. In speculative history, you take the evidence you've got and you present it. You make a case based on it. And anyone who doesn't agree with it can point to it and say, well, I don't agree with that. And one of the things that they will say is there's no evidence to support that. Now, the correct response is that's true. But on the basis of the evidence we have and the knowledge and understanding of the context, this is an explanation that fits. But historians generally, they don't like to walk down that line because it doesn't take much new evidence to push it aside. But when you have to, you do it. So for example, in, 20, in 1211, we don't have much evidence other than what I presented to you. And the chance of any new evidence coming along are pretty short, small. So you put together and what you get is what we, what you heard about, read in the article. Now, in the case of Pacioli, his literature, as far as the English language is concerned, his the knowledge of his him himself, his, the biography part, comes mainly from uh, Emmett Taylor's book published in 1942, which is a biography called No Royal Road. And what he does in there is he joins up evidence using what he knows of context to arrive at certain things that explain what was taking place. So he had a situation where it was, it was known that Pacioli had some contact with uh, Duke of Urbino. And it, it was known that was very central to his publication of Summa Arithmetica, the book in which the bookkeeping is kept. And they know that Pacioli came from the same town, San Sepulcro, as uh, Piero della Francesca, who was one of the leading painters, artists of his day. And Taylor just speculated, well, he was there, Piero was there, Piero would have gone to Urbino to, to try and get a commission or to look in the library to get some help with his work. His painters needed a lot of help in the maths part, for example. 
So therefore, we just join the dots up by saying that when Piero was going to Urbina from San Sepulcro, actually came to, and they just walked across the hills to it. It's not terribly far away. And the truth is that neither of those is supported by any evidence. He was neither, there's no evidence to say he was Piero's favourite pupil. In fact, there's evidence to say he wasn't, because Piero was hardly ever there in the period that really would have been relevant. And there's no evidence that he was ever brought by the painter to Urbino. But they provide a believable explanation. So there's your speculative history. Now, since Taylor wrote his book in 1942, we've learned a lot more. And we know that's not true. There's no way that, that this could be true because of the circumstances, because of uh, where Piero was during the time he was there. So we have a history that, that's been written based on speculation because that was really all that could be done, but now we know it's not. And in the meantime, an underlying uh, set of historical assumptions has been developed. So Taylor created these historical facts which weren't, and he at no point made it clear these were not based on evidence. They formed the basis for the biographical material in a translation of Bacioli's bookkeeping treatise done in 1963. So it, was, it had this biographical material before the, the treatise. And that, again, was used as a source for a video published in 1990 to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the publication of, of um, Summa Arithmetica, and two accompanying articles were published as well. The film is very faithful to Taylor, and it's been watched 184,000 times. So this it's spreading, what Taylor said, and it's speculative history. And we now know it's not correct. So there are dangers in using speculative history. And it's one of the reasons why historians tend to go back and have another look at previous items or events and see if the new evidence available changes interpretation and understanding. So you've got the undermining of Pacioli, which in turn is an undermining of the treatise on bookkeeping. He could not have written it because he was a friar, not a bookkeeper. And the assertion by uh, Yami that it was deficient because no one could learn from it. And these started to have an impact on how people perceived that treatise. Another thing that had an impact on how people perceived the treatise and therefore perceived how important Pacioli was, changed their perception, was that they couldn't get past the fact that Pacioli had written an encyclopedia. They think it's an encyclopedia. The Summa Arithmetic is an encyclopedia of maths. And they never understood why there's a chapter in it on double entry bookkeeping. I sort of assumed that it was a late edition and there was no real reason for it, and that's based on the way that Pacioli introduces it. But there was a good reason for it, as you'll see next week. But it ended up with a literature that really didn't believe that A, Pacioli had written it, B, that he could have written it, or C, that it was much good. So therefore, no one learned from it, didn't really have any impact whatsoever. It just makes curiosity. And the one thing that did happen was because it was printed, other people copied his style to some extent and wrote their own manuals that were better because they were teachers and it just spread across Europe on the back of that. So Pacioli's contribution was solely that, that he had printed it no more. However, what he said, as is shown in that article, was rather more than what people realised. And despite Basil Yami's claims that he didn't indicate which account to debit and which account to credit, he most certainly did. But he did it in the sense or in the way that we describe as teaching by principles. And he focused on the things that you need to know if you're going to be good at double entry. And he presented something that in his to completely transferable. It's not a set of rules, it's a set of procedures to go through. 
And you start, as shown there, with all the transactions involving two elements, an item exchange and a form of settlement. Now you know that from any transaction, you know that something's been exchanged for something else. So you can identify those very easily. If you sell a car for cash, cash is the form of settlement and the car is the item exchanged. One is a debit, one's a credit. Good, okay, that's fine. And debit always equals credit. So you always know that the amounts in the two entries, the debit and the credit, will be the same. He then t said that and any form of settlement is as good as any other in terms of how you record them. So it doesn't matter what form of settlement is used, this will always work. Cash received as a debit. So if you sell a car for cash, you're going to debit the cash. If you buy a car for cash, you're obviously not going to debit the cash. If a former settlement receives the debit and the item exchange is there for the credit, so you would debit the cash because you sold the car for cash and you credit the car. And then you see in the diagram there it goes through the alternative. Now because all forms of settlement um, can substitute for each other, it doesn't matter how something was settled. So all you need to know in order to, to do double entry correctly is which two accounts are involved. That's it. And then you can identify from the transaction which of the two elements was the form of settlement. And that always tells you which, is, which account is to be debited and which is to be credited. And the problem that learners have is that they can't work out how to go from identifying the two elements to deciding which should be debited and which should be credited. That surely gave them that information. And you could see below there what he thought the forms of settlement were. It's very, very simple, and every student who wants to learn double entry could learn it quite quickly doing that. However, the people that wrote the, book, the bookkeeping manuals after Pacioli didn't do that. None of them did it. No one did it. And we'll go on now to what they did in its place. But first of all, there's a, a lot in the literature, the county history literature, about the spread of double entry, the fusion of double entry. Pierre Genin uh, was, was French uh, he, and he did a huge study of early modern published books. There were four volumes covering the periods and he wasn't on his, he wasn't on his own all the time. But he, he identified 782 editions of manuals of bookkeeping and accounting published in that 300 year period most of them from 1600 onwards. And he looked through them and he analysed them and, and he interpreted what they were doing and who was writing them and why they were writing them. And he thought about why do they need so many editions of these manuals? Basil Yami, his conclusion was, well, they basically don't teach how to do a proper loss of balance sheet. Couldn't go any further because he hadn't looked at a big enough sample. But Janine had... And he concluded basically that the number of editions tells us that there was a great demand to know how to do double entry bookkeeping, which means there was a great number of people using it. You won't find that acknowledgement in the county history literature because there's a great deal of resistance to it, partly because there's a lack of belief that Pacioli could have taught anyone, and also because there's a lack of evidence of the use of double entry in actual ledgers that have survived from the period from 1500 onwards to, to 1800. But part of that is because the definition used by the people who have looked at any of those manuals has been the, the type that Raymond de Rouver used, where you have to prepare income statements and balance sheets. And double entry is a bookkeeping method which does not include preparing income statements and balance sheets. So that literature that says there's nothing much 
there's not much use of double entry between 1500 and 1800 is fundamentally flawed because of the definitions that were used in the first place. Now, just thinking about what evidence there is to support Janine's comment, well, you've got the coverage in Pacioli's for a start, which had no coverage of the income statement of the balance sheet. You've got Manzoni. So if you look at the list of his topics, there's a lot of similarities in the previous uh, lecture. I showed you a table of the topics in uh, Pacioli Talienti. Um, and Manzoni just to see what the syllabus was likely to be in so here is in more detail. You see these things like the state lottery. The state lottery was, was fairly recent at that time. Very popular. People gambled a lot. Um, personal things are mixed in with business things, you see that. Uh, there's coverage of barter which is extremely common. But basically the one thing that's missing from all that is preparation of financial reports or financial statements. They weren't interested. So there's evidence to support what Janine said. Bear in mind that he formed the opinion he did from looking at manuals like Manzoni's. So those were his rules of double entry bookkeeping that he had in this in his manual. He decided well, we can't do it Pacioli's way, we can't have this because it doesn't help people. The way Pacioli set it out doesn't help people to decide on which accounts to debit and credit. So he decided we'll have rules. And he created these six rules. And anyone learning from his manual had to learn each of those rules. None of, no one should learn those rules, they're not needed. But that was the approach. And after he did that, virtually all the manuals published copied that. They included his uh, exemplar entries, which he had at the end, which was a complete journal, a complete ledger. And they included his rules or they included rules of their own. And in fact, the number of rules kept over time increasing till you got to the, the most that is recognized in any book, any manual published in the period was 74. Imagine having to learn 74 rules to be able to do double entry, when in its place, you can use that. But no one wanted to know about it because uh, they didn't believe that Patchouli was capable of having written it. And they preferred to do it with lots of examples. So that's basically the two articles. And they show you how the use of print began the diffusion of double entry across Europe. Patchouli started it and his manual was scattered across the Europe. The number of copies, as I said before, between one and two thousand, it's more likely to be near two thousand. That's based on production schedules and speed and the number of surviving copies. So around about two thousand copies. There was around about seven hundred published in the second edition in 1523 by the same publisher, which tells us the first edition had sold out. And that spread the, his method, but what, what people looked at based on the markings inside Summa Arithmetica, the big book in which it's contained, is they looked at the maths, they didn't look at the bookkeeping. It was when Talienti published his a very small manual and double entry that it began to spread a bit within Venice. But Manzoni, his publication with its six editions, possibly more, was what really spread the method across Europe, because others saw how he'd done it. They noticed the rules, they noticed the use of the example of a journal and a ledger, and they copied it. And the people who did that believed that people could learn how to do double entry, taking that approach, and that's persisted to the present day. When research into um, 
how students learn double entry has been going on for virtually 100 years. And if you read it all, you would see that there's a perception in that literature that this does that the rules do not work. Typically, only half the students ever learn double entry while at university. They get partial knowledge. And that where double entry is really learned is in the workplace by being basically handed a bunch of invoices and receipts and told to get on with it and put entries into double entry system. Nowadays that would be done on a computer, so even that stage of learning isn't so much done as in the past. And taking that forward, and this is one of the lessons from this analysis of, of the history of accounting, taking that forward, it suggests that unless there's a change made in how double entry is learnt, expertise in double entry amongst accountants is going to fall. And that has serious implications for the accounting profession. So it's quite a big area for people to think about. The history of accounting tells us that we've been trying for 600 years to teach people how to learn using either examples, example journals, example ledgers, or using rules of a combination. And that was in the days when people would actually learn on the job. You get a little bit of the basics and then you go and do work. That doesn't exist anymore. So what do we learn from history? Well, there was another method and this was it. It's been shown to be much more effective than rules when it's been taught in the classroom. And unless that changes then in future, accountants are going to find it much more difficult to actually have the expertise they need in order to explain to their clients and to everyone else how adjustments will be made in, it, in financial statements or to interpret what the implication is for an adjustment being made. And they're very important tools for accountants. So anyway, that's the end of that. Next week, you're going on to the next stage. Where in the course of the week, you're going to get very much closer to what Patrick did.